Good evening. My name is Pete Peterson, and I am Dean of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy, and I welcome you here to the Smothers Theater for tonight's conversation about free speech on America's college campuses. A logical question would be to ask, why would a graduate policy school even care about such issues? Well, as a program that prepares students for careers in the public square, I've become increasingly concerned about our ability as Americans to perform the essential tasks of citizen leaders, to deliberate and debate about the common good with people with whom we may disagree. At Pepperdine, we call this the practice of convicted civility. But with each passing day, through public sector strikes at the local level and government shutdowns at the federal, it appears we are less and less able to find that common sense out of conflicting interests. Many on the left and right are beginning to wonder whether some of this increasing inability to empathize and sympathize with those with whom we disagree might begin in the college years on America's college campuses, where we've seen a growing number of speaker invitations and disinvitations and conflict between students. The issue of free speech on, in academia is complex and wide-ranging, with some calling for tighter regulations on speech, while others see the origins of our problems in the broader culture. In a disturbing essay for her campus newspaper, The Sophian, Smith College 2018 graduating senior Kim Barron described her four years at one of America's great education institutions this way. During my first days at Smith, I witnessed countless conversations that consisted of one person telling another person that their opinion was wrong. The word offensive was almost always included in the reasoning. Within a few short weeks, members of my graduating, my freshman class, had quickly assimilated to this new way of non-thinking. They could soon detect a politically incorrect view and call the person out on their mistake. I began to voice my opinion less, often to avoid being berated and judged by a community that claims to represent the free expression of ideas. I learned, along with every other student, to walk on eggshells for fear that I may say something offensive. That is the social norm here. To be clear, while conservatives and students of faith, particularly Christians and Jews, report very similar impressions of their undergraduate experience, a growing number of progressive students are also saying comparable things. In a 2017 YouGov survey of 1,200 undergrad students, nearly 60% of self-described very liberal students responded that they stopped sharing their political opinions in class and on campus because, and I quote, I thought that classmates would judge me. This was the highest percentage of any of the ideological categories measured. My fear is that an eggshell campus climate is contributing to our eggshell public square. In a 2018 national study titled Hidden Tribes, a study of America's polarized political landscape, the majority of focus group respondents from across the political spectrum said they feared saying the wrong thing in a conversation about race, ethnicity, or politics. There are only two kinds of people who live in eggshell environments. Those who squelch their opinions out of fear and those who enjoy breaking eggshells. Suffice it to say, this is not the ground upon which a healthy republic can be built or sustained. Tonight's conversation, then, with such esteemed advocates of free speech, and professors Amy Wax and Alan Dershowitz, is not just about free speech on campus, but about what kind of public square we'll have in the years to come. This is why I'm so grateful to partner with the Steamboat Institute in hosting this important conversation. Like us, the Institute shares our support of viewpoint diversity and the free and open pursuit of the truth. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming the CEO of the Steamboat Institute, 
Jennifer Schubert Aiken, who will formally introduce tonight's speakers. Today. And I must say, it was really nice to be in a place where there was not three feet of snow covering the ground, as there is back home in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. So um, it's great to be here in beautiful Malibu, and we really appreciate being invited to your campus. In the 10 years since our founding, the Steamboat Institute is proud that we have earned a nationwide reputation for offering unique and entertaining programs which provide ordinary citizens, just like all of us, with direct and personal access to our nation's leaders in journalism, the media, business, government, education, the military, and the entertainment industry. Through our innovative program and providing this direct access to leaders on the national and global stage, the Steamboat Institute inspires ordinary citizens to learn more about our nation's founding principles and to then use that knowledge to gain a better understanding of public policy, individual liberty, and the proper role of government, and hopefully get inspired to get involved. I want to stress that we welcome everyone to our programs always, regardless of your political ideology, whether you're on the left or on the right, you're always welcome. We welcome anyone who comes with an open mind and wants to learn more about the issue that's being discussed. Well, last year, we kicked off our inaugural Campus Liberty Tour with a debate tour featuring Nigel Farage, who was the architect of the Brexit movement, and Vicente Fox, the former president of Mexico, debating nationalism versus globalism. We toured four college campuses in five days with these two, and let me tell you, that was quite the experience. We uh, started at CU Boulder, uh, where uh, Professor Bob Kaufman moderated the debate, CU Colorado Springs, the University of Maryland in College Park, and Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania. We had between 500 and 1,000 people at each of these events, plus the Maryland debate was carried live on C-SPAN. So that was really exciting. But the most exciting thing about the Campus Liberty Tour was that each campus, the response we received from the students on both the left and the right, it was overwhelmingly positive. Over and over again, we heard from the students how much they enjoyed hearing an actual debate using reason and logic and conducted in a respectful manner, rather than people screaming at one another and simply calling the other side stupid or worse. As Professor Dershowitz wrote in his new book, and I hope you'll uh, have a chance to, to get a copy afterwards if you've not already, he wrote, America is a poorer nation as a result of the death or at least the dearth of dialogue, and we couldn't agree more. It is the goal of Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour to restore this dialogue to college campuses. We believe that critical thinking skills can be developed and robust but respectful dialogue restored through diligent effort and practice, just like learning how to swim or learning how to play the piano. You have to practice these things to make it become part of your, of your daily life. Well, last evening, we hosted a similar discussion on campus free speech at uh, Cal Berkeley with Professor Dershowitz, um, and we had Richard Epstein, pro professor, a law professor from NYU, participate in that uh, discussion, and it was moderated by recently retired uh, Judge Janice Rogers Brown, who was on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. So it was a very robust and wonderful discussion that once again was, was greeted very warmly by the, the students and others who attended. Our mission with the Campus Liberty Tour is to teach students and all who attend how to think, not what to think. We believe it's important to hear viewpoints with which you may disagree. As John Stuart Mill famously remarked, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. I would also like to thank our major sponsors and the foundations who share our vision for teaching critical thinking skills and encouraging free speech and debate on college campuses. These include Harris Ranch, which is based right here in California, the Michael Prino Family Foundation in Denver, 
the Snyder Foundation in Pennsylvania, and the Woodford Foundation for Limited Government in Colorado. Without their unwavering support and vision, we would not be able to bring you this compelling discussion this evening. I would also like to extend a huge thank you again to Dean Pete Peterson, as well as Professor Bob Kaufman and the Pepperdine School of Public Policy for their generous support and collaboration with the Steamboat Institute in bringing this discussion to you this evening. They have been an absolute delight to work with, and you should be very proud of your School of Public Policy here. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening's discussion, Professor Bob Kaufman. It was almost exactly a year ago, it was first week of February last year, that we were visiting with Professor Kaufman and his wife, Anne, after Professor Kaufman spoke at a Steamboat Institute event in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. He was at that time the visiting scholar in conservative thought and policy at CU in Boulder, and he suggested that the Steamboat Institute should consider bringing the Campus Liberty Tour to Pepperdine. Uh, so later uh, last spring, uh, Professor Kaufman then served as the moderator of our debate with Nigel Farage and Vicente Fox um, at the debate in Boulder. And it was, as I said, it was a lively discussion and Professor Kaufman did a masterful job moderating. So we continued to follow up on this discussion um, after he left Colorado and uh, returned to Malibu. And so here we are almost exactly a year later. Um, professor Kaufman, for those of you who don't already know him, is the Robert and Catherine Dotson Professor of Public Policy here at the Pepperdine School of Public Policy. He specializes in foreign policy, national security, international relations, and various aspects of American politics. He received his JD from Georgetown University Law School, as well as his bachelor's, two masters, and a PhD from Columbia University in New York. In May 2016, he received an advanced law degree in dispute resolution from the Pepperdine School of Law. Dr. Kaufman has written frequently for numerous publications, including the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. He is the author of four books, including the recent Dangerous Doctrine, How Obama's Grand Strategy Weakened America. He is currently working on a new publication entitled The Principal Realism of President Trump. Two cheers. <laughs> It's a great pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening, a happy academic warrior and a good friend of the Steamboat Institute, Professor Bob Kaufman. Jennifer, thank you for the very kind introduction, and thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I'll get in trouble with Pepperdine uh, deviating from the mission, but if the meek shall inherit the earth, they're on vacation tonight. <laughs> we have with us two intrepid, courageous, principled, highly capable um, academic warriors uh, committed to free speech. Uh, Professor Amy Wax and Alan Dershowitz. Amy insisted on a short introduction. I'm going to oblige. Uh, she's the Munline Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, impeccably and broadly educated with a JD and an MD. She's written numerous scholarly articles in journals of the first rank. She is a public intellectual who is formidable. Uh, in 2010, the New Republic described her book, Race, Wrong, and Remedies, as the quintessence of good sense and intellectual clarity, the best book in the year of the year on that subject. Uh, Amy, thank you for being here. Thank you too to Alan Dershowitz, the uh, Felix Frankfurter Professor Emeritus at Harvard University. Alan is the author of more than a thousand articles in elite popular publications, countless law review articles of the first rank, five best-selling books, and the favorite book of mine is his courageous, intrepid, The Defense for Israel. Uh, now more than a few college campuses have become like the United Nations Security Council. 
Ellie Wiesel, the Nobel Prize laureate, said of Alan Dershowitz, and I'm paraphrasing, if there had been more people like Alan Dershowitz in the 30s and the 40s, the history of European Jewry would have been different. My gravest um, concern about Alan Dershowitz is his judgment. For some reason, he picked Martha's Vineyard then, rather than my father's <laughs> hometown of Nantucket as the, his vacation spot. You can't have perfect judgment in everything. <laughs> Nevertheless, thank you, Alan Dershowitz, for coming. Thank you. Let me explain the format, which will have two parts. Uh, in the first part, I will engage both of the panelists with a series of comments and questions to stimulate their observations. That will last about half an hour. In the second part, we will take, or I will take, questions directly from the audience with a proviso, a couple. One, they are genuine questions rather than statements disguised as questions. And two, you get to the point. You have 30 seconds to articulate a clear question, otherwise I'll cut you off at the knees and take pleasure doing it. <laughs> so I don't want to do that start with segment one, and if uh, the panelists don't mind, let me begin by uh, asking Amy Wax uh, to discuss her entree into the issue of free speech. Amy, you become a, a hero to some and a villain to others uh, on campus uh, by becoming uh, at the center of uh, an intellectual maelstrom for what seemed to be a very innocuous beginning, uh, an editorial you published with uh, Larry Alexander in the Philadelphia Inquirer that made up what seemed to be a defensible point that some cultures prepare uh, their citizens for modernity better than others, and that began a Nantucket sleigh ride of controversy. That's your segue to begin. Yes, well, first of all, let me say that I, I'm glad that Professor Kaufman doesn't know where I go on vacation. Uh, I know now. Which one? <laughs> All the usual places. Uh, no, my saga began uh, when I did publish this op-ed in the Philadelphia Inquirer a year and a half ago now, um, paying the price for the decline of bourgeois culture, and it might as well have been called paying the price for praising bourgeois culture, because that is what I have done for the past year and a half. Um, in the op-ed, we talked about certain values that are the mainstays and the stalwarts of our great country, our great civilization, uh, the values of, of reliability, of hard work, of industry, of honesty, sobriety, uh, of gratitude, order, and uh, thrift. Uh, the list goes on. Uh, and how people who uh, adhere to those values uh, or certainly believe in them have in general been on average more successful, not infallibly so, because of course uh, luck has something to do with it, uh, but these are important rules of behavior. Uh, and then we went on to bemoan what we viewed as uh, a decline in, in some of these behaviors. And more generally, of course, stated that um, some cultures uh, prepare people better for modern technological societies than others. Uh, and this elicited uh, really a, a firestorm that I had not anticipated. Um, apparently, uh, it's offensive, and there's that word again, uh, and insulting to some people to praise uh, these kinds of behaviors and values, uh, and it's also unacceptable to make distinctions among different cultures and ways of life, uh, even if you give good reasons for elevating some over others. Uh, and people complained, uh, petitions were launched condemning me, uh, 
My dean was barraged with demands that I be uh, fired, uh, defenestrated, destroyed, uh, all other, other sorts of horrible things uh, happening to me. Uh, and then I think in the most disappointing gesture, 33 of my colleagues, uh, half of the faculty, wrote an open letter in the school newspaper condemning me and rejecting all my views, whatever that meant, without articulating what views they were rejecting, without giving reasons for condemning me. It just was an outright condemnation. And that's when I really felt I needed to fight back because condemnation without arguments, without reasons, uh, the rejection of open debate based on evidence, that to me was a fundamental violation of academic values. And it was incumbent upon me to get out there and say so. Uh, and that, of course, just got me in more trouble. <laughs> Alan Dershowitz, you've had your own battles with this uh, at uh, Berkeley in the fall. Uh, the university initially withdrew an invitation because of uh, protests, uh, because you were giving a speech uh, defending Israel on campus. I want you to talk about that, but also as a segue, you also did an interview with Dan Dennis Prager in the fall, where you said, I quote, uh, rejecting categorically the idea of safe spaces. You said, if you want to feel good, get a massage. <laughs> University campuses are arenas of vigorous debate, and you also complained not only about the idea of a safe space, but that they were selectively applied to chill certain types of issues and certain types of views. Could you comment and elaborate? Sure, thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, wonderful event. <laughs> at this beautiful campus I debated Kent Starr. We had a wonderful time. So um, I think I invented trigger warnings. Before the term was even known, the first or second year I taught at Harvard Law School, I said, if you really want to feel good about yourself, you want to feel comfortable, there's a terrific spot down the road. If you're going to be in my class, you're going to sweat, you're going to be furious at me, I'm going to challenge every idea you ever had, um, in 50 years of teaching, I don't think I ever expressed a personal view in a classroom. Um, I expressed devil's advocate's views all the time. Um, I would defend the death penalty even though I personally oppose it. Students, unless they read my outside material, didn't know what my views were from class because I agreed with our chairperson that the role of the university is to teach students how to think, not what to think. My engagement with free speech goes back uh, 60 years, um, 65 years. When I was a first year student at Brooklyn College, first in my family ever to go to college, I grew up in a family that didn't have culture or much education, so when I went to Brooklyn College, I was shocked to see that there were attempts to censor um, left-wing professors. Uh, a professor named Slockauer was being fired because he had refused to answer questions in front of the House and American Activities Committee. And the man who was pressing the hardest to have him fired was the man who I got to know named Eugene Scalia, who had a very famous son. And um, so my first encounter with censorship was censorship from the right against the left. And my second encounter was when I went to Stanford to teach for a year, and it was the year of the free speech movement at Berkeley. And I went up to Berkeley expecting to be thrilled at the free speech uh, movement, and I was extremely disappointed because the people who were pushing for free speech weren't really pushing for universal free speech. It was free speech for me, but not for thee. And I've seen that continue to the present time. Today, the heroes of free speech are conservatives, and I praise them for their heroism in defending free speech. But, 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 you'll hear what I have to say, and then you'll know why I get invited everywhere once. Uh, I am concerned that too many on the conservative side 
are involved in free speech for me, but not for thee. It's the conservatives who are being banned on college campuses today. So it's easy to be a defender of free speech, much like it was easy for the communists to be defenders of free speech back in the 50s, because they were being banned. The key to defending free speech is defending the free speech of those with whom you disagree. Defending free speech universally, across the board. I'll never forget when I defended the rights of Nazis to march in Skokie, I was then on the National Board of the American Civil Liberties Union, as my grandmother would say, Allah shalom. It's a blessing for the dead. The American Civil Liberties Union is gone and dead and buried. Um, but they used to be a civil liberties organization. And we defended the rights of Nazis to march through Skokie. And my mother called me on the phone and said, son, which side do you want, the Nazis or the Jews? I said, Mom, I'm, I'm, I'm on the side of civil liberties. She said, don't give me that highfalutin stuff. I'm your mother. You have to pick. You either have to be on the side of the Jews or the side of the Nazis. And my mother was not educated. I understand that. But I'm hearing that today. I'm hearing that today from my colleagues at Harvard. I'm defending the civil liberties of a man they despise and a man who I voted against, President Donald Trump. And they are telling me I have to choose sides. I can't defend the rights of Donald Trump without being perceived as a supporter of his policies and his politics. They understand better than that, but they won't accept it. And on college campuses today, I'm afraid we're seeing much too much of free speech for me, but not for thee. For the first time in modern academic history, we're seeing professors write essays, theoretical essays, against the concept of freedom of speech, saying it's paternalistic, it's hegemonic, it's capitalistic, it's a way of oppressors keeping the oppressed down by free speech. Tell that to Martin Luther King, the way he used free speech against oppressors. But we're hearing it today from so many quarters on college campuses. And I worry, as I think so many of us do today here, that you can always tell what the future is going to be like when you look at college campuses today, because the students are tomorrow's leaders. And the lack of appreciation for free speech, only a small number of hard radical leftists and hard hard rightists would really say out loud that they don't believe in free speech. But great many college students today don't care about free speech. It's not a priority issue. So I'm going to continue to defend free speech as long as I have the strength to do it. And I'm going to do it for people who I despise, for people who I disagree with, for people who are, I am offended by. And I'll leave it to others to defend the free speech of those with whom they agree. That's too easy. <laughs>
tend to live on the coasts and have um, elite educations, go to selective colleges, uh, and, and lean progressive by and large. Uh, and the rest of the population, including the middle class and the lower middle class, working people, people who don't necessarily have an advanced education. Uh, and these people live separate lives, they have, they live in different neighborhoods, uh, they don't often mix, um, they have different cultural tastes. And he identifies this as a growing trend and one that is a departure from the past when people from different walks of life mixed a lot more. So I think this attitude towards what's important, right? Enforcing political correctness or resisting political correctness, uh, wide open debate, open mindedness versus catering to these values of diversity and equity and inclusion by which is meant, you know, strict equality of result, not just the meritocracy and let the chips fall where they may, but really something far more extreme than that and ideological. This divide is just part of uh, this growing separation, uh, which bodes very ill for our country. So I think that the elite universities have become their own societies with their own values, uh, which they believe in as correct. The progressives have taken them over. They have marched through the institutions, as Gramsci says. They have almost now complete control of these institutions, and they are out of sync with a very large portion of uh, our population. Uh, and I think what's happening politically right now in our country very much is a reflection of that. Uh, we can talk about what some of the solutions would be, uh, what we ought to do about it. I think one of the things we ought to do about it is um, turn our, the elites should be much more focused on the average person. Uh, and what life is like for the ordinary, quote unquote, unspecial people. And here we're talking about what Hillary Clinton designates the deplorables, uh, then people like them. But I don't really see that happening. There's a lot of lip service paid to caring about the less fortunate. But here we're talking about people uh, the most poor of the poor, the very bottom of society, and of course, special solicitude to favored minorities, but not just your average person. Uh, and of course, I'm very interested in other people's opinions about what to do on this, this problem. I think the most uh, overused and misunderstood word on college campuses today is, is diversity. Um, the last thing the radical left wants is real diversity. They want more black people, more women, more gay people who think exactly like them. Um, the last thing they want are black people who disagree with them, who are conservatives, or gay people who are conservatives, or women who are conservatives. So what we lack today on many universities is real diversity of points of view, and we all know the data that 90-something percent of professors uh, vote Democrat or liberals. I'm one of them, um, but I would much prefer to see a place which was ideologically more diverse. Now, here's the real problem. How do you get it? You can't have a litmus test. Uh, I don't think there's anybody on this panel, we're all opposed, I think, to racial quotas. Uh, I think we would be equally opposed to political quotas, that you need you know, 40% of all new hires have to be Republicans or conservatives. Uh, that is not the right approach. So it's very, very difficult. When I first came to Harvard in 1964, I was the token liberal. There was two other professors who could be regarded as, as liberals, um, uh, Vern Countryman and uh, another professor, but I was the young liberal. Um, today, of course, and, and I would say 90, 80% of the faculty voted Republican. That was typical of law schools in those days. So in only a half a century, everything has shifted dramatically. And so what I'd like to th really throw out to all three of us, and maybe we can get some input from the audience, how do you solve 
This problem, let me, let me tell you how one way of doing it. A student, when I made this point, or a similar point yesterday, a student came over to me afterward. He was a PhD student at University of California, Berkeley, and he was applying for jobs teaching mathematics at the University of California. And one of the things he had to do to get a job as a professor was to make a commitment to diversity and inclusiveness. And he said, I can't do that. I don't believe in identity politics. I believe in equality, but I don't believe in these things. And so I'm not going to be able to get a job teaching at the University of California because they're violating my First Amendment by forcing me to say something that I don't believe in and refuse to say. And as I said to him, Albert Einstein probably couldn't get hired at the University of California because he probably would refuse to take a loyalty oath. You know, I grew up hating loyalty oaths. For me, loyalty oaths were McCarthyism and Roy Cohen and all of that. Today, we have the functional equivalent of royalty, loyalty oaths coming from the left and imposed on people who disagree with them. I think it's a terrible dilemma, and I don't think there's an obvious solution. And if any of you can come up with a solution about how to create more intellectual diversity without having litmus tests, I would be very interested in seeing how we can implement that, because it's a real problem today on university campuses, lack of intellectual diversity. I, I just want to say that I think the word diversity has been hijacked and perverted by the progressive left, and they've been very clever and very diabolical about the way in which they have hijacked and perverted many seemingly innocuous concepts. There's a distinction between spontaneous diversity and what I term forced diversity. Spontaneous diversity is something that, you know, is, is an unalloyed good when the meritocracy, which is our way of life and our system for good and sufficient reason, and I'm perfectly prepared to defend the meritocracy, results in people from different walks of life or different groups being elevated to positions of responsibility based on their ability, based on their competence. We all win from that system. But the kind of diversity that is being pushed on campuses today is a very different thing. It is a diversity that is being pursued in the name of the meritocracy, but in fact uh, has quite an opposite effect. It, it destroys the meritocracy because it says that regardless of talents or competence, the end result has to be equal representation of identity groups, no matter what. And that, I think, is something that many people uh, have trouble signing on to, including your friend, the PhD student. Uh, but once again, people are required to pay fealty to this concept because it is unquestionably superior, and no one can question its superiority. Let me just add that uh, Harvey Mansfield, professor of politics at Harvard, of government at Harvard, had a wonderful interview online in an uh, outlet called In Point. And he makes a very, very shrewd observation. The progressive left has taken a lot of issues that ought to be politically debated, that are of the essence of politics, and that people can have legitimately different opinions that need to be aired and worked out, has taken them off the table by creating this hierarchy of virtue that says, once we figure out the answer, which is forced diversity, mm -hmm. and we attach to it this moral superiority, all good people must pay fealty to it, and there's nothing more to say. There's no need for any further discussion or debate. So Indeed, further discussion and debate is deemed are, offensive. Right, and discussion or debate is deemed not just offensive, but evil. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we have to stop talking about it. Uh, so I think that, you know, that is part and parcel of what is going on on campus today. We are depoliticizing, of course, it's, it's entirely political because it's about power, but through the exercise of power, 
uh, we are taking off the table of legitimate public debate a whole host of, of issues and topics. Let me give you some good news about that. So about uh, five years ago, in my last year of teaching at Harvard, we, uh, decided to teach a course called Taboo. The subject of the course were 10 subjects that you're not allowed to talk about in colleges. And that was the course. We got 900 students registered for the course. We talked about every one of these issues that you're not allowed to talk about. We even talked about racial differences, genetic, all of the issues you're not supposed to talk about. We talked about the bourgeois arguments that you're making. You would have been an ideal person to come to the class. For the last class, we invited Larry Summers, who had just been fired as president of Harvard. And he came to the class and he said, I don't know why you invited me to this class. And I said, Larry, maybe that's the problem. Because he had just lost his job for making a controversial statement of fact, which may be true, false, partially true, partially false, based on empirical evidence, not based on empirical evidence, but he couldn't make it. In fact, there was a wonderful cartoon in the Globe. It had Larry Summers begging the Board of Overseers of Harvard for his job back. He said, you misunderstood me. I didn't really say that women are less capable of learning physics than men. I said, Israel is the worst human rights offender in the world. Now can I get my job back? <laughs> Make the point very so what can be done, and is it um, something like the University of Chicago did in 2014, issuing a state affirming traditional academic freedom and commitment to robust debate? Uh, although, Amy, you have uh, rightly distinguished between the legal leverage between public and private universities, is it making uh, government uh, aid conditional uh, in private universities on accepting the First Amendment? What can we do about where we are now? Well, I have to say, first of all, uh, it is very important, and conservatives have long believed in a public-private distinction because uh, the more, the wider the ambit for government, the more the potential for the abuse of power and for totalitarian uh, moves. So it's, it's good that we have a robust private sector, but one of the costs of that is that the First Amendment does not technically apply to private universities. Uh, and so really what's necessary for private universities to return to their mission uh, is a commitment to what I call academic values. Uh, the law has limited ambit here. I don't think that there are legal solutions to this problem. I think it is a matter of commitments and values that we have lost the commitments uh, that our values have become debased and politicized. Uh, and we have a generation now uh, that simply does not believe in the value of robust, wide open debate. In a way, they're kind of spoiled because they are living in this wonderful, abundant society, not flawless by any means, but uh, privileged in, in many, many ways. And they simply do not understand the struggles uh, that their predecessors uh, have gone through in order to produce uh, this wonderful civilization. And of course, that's one of the defects of our education system, that we do not teach people uh, about the long struggle, the legacy that they are enjoying, and so they don't feel the proper gratitude uh, for it. Um, so, you know, this is, this is a very, very hard problem to solve. I'm a little bit pessimistic about it because I think that the progressive left now has almost a complete stranglehold over the most influential institutions. And of course, these institutions are gateway institutions that control access to 
the upper middle class to prestigious and powerful jobs. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to get their kid into, you know, some top 20 school. There's a scramble to do that. Nobody wants to rock the boat. I call it the little Caitlin problem. We're going to keep our head down because we want little Caitlin to get into Harvard and we want her to get out of Harvard. Uh, so she can have a good life and on some level we don't really care what's going on while she's there. So, you know, how do we get people to care? It's very difficult. Um, one of the projects I'm working on now is an article called Defund the Ivies. Uh, I do believe that wealthy people should decisively turn their money and attention away from these selected schools, which have become a library. They are uh, teaching our children to hate their own uh, country, their own culture, their own civilization, all of its achievements, all of its accomplishments, uh, everything that they enjoy. They're teaching them ingratitude. Uh, and I think that's that's morally terrible. Uh, and they have enough money. They have too much money and too much influence. And here's the question I would ask. This, you know, I don't think you can accomplish this by appealing to politics because a lot of people with money are very left-leaning. What I would say to them is, what about the average person? What have you done lately? for the ordinary working class person. Last week, I visited a wonderful institution called the Williamson College of the Trades. The Williamson College of the Trades is in Media, Pennsylvania. It's existed since 1880. It educates every year 100 young men. It is a male institution in various trades, uh, skilled jobs, carpentry, masonry, machine shop, uh, computer skills for working in manufacturing, uh, for people who are not interested in going to a four-year academic institution. And the young men I met there uh, were wonderful. It's a place that is run along quasi-military lines. Uh, there are high demands. There's character education. Uh, there's guidance on how to start businesses, how to deal with the public. We need a hundred Williamson Colleges of the trade. We need five hundred. Um, many of my progressive friends would say exactly the same thing. We don't care enough about the average person. We ought to have more trade schools. My, no progressive, my progressive friends are against Ivy League universities. They would like to defend. You know, I think you're a closet progressive. <laughs> and uh, I do think you overstate the issue about Ivy League universities. They don't all teach all of these things. Harvard has Harvey Mansfield and, and Jack Goldsmith. And when I was there, we taught very, very different things. And, and students come away from Ivy League schools with very different commitments, many of them commitments to go to the poorest neighborhoods and to work with the poorest of people. Let me tell you where I think the problem lies. And again, this is gonna raise some eyebrows. I think the problem is with the concept of truth. Truth, capital T, R-U-T-H, truth. Uh, you put your finger on one part of it. People on the hard left, and I think some people on the hard right, think they have a monopoly on truth. They know the right answers. They know all the right answers, and they may tolerate or give lip service to debate and discussion, but in the end, they're not going to change their mind because they know the truth, whether it's a Marxist truth or Frederick von Hayek truth, or there is truth. When I was growing up, I went to yeshiva. I hated it because my rabbis knew the truth. And uh, when I would raise a question, my rabbis would say to me, look, if the question you're asking is such a good one, then the great rabbis before you who were so much smarter than you would have asked the question first. If the question isn't such a good one because the rabbis didn't ask you first, why are you asking? They knew the truth. They knew the truth. I don't like the concept of truth. I like the concept of the truthing process. The truthing process. 
and most areas will never get to any the truth. And it applies not only to free speech, it applies to due process. When a woman accuses a man of sexual assault on a campus, that's the truth. Well, why do we have to have due process? Why do we have to have cross-examination? Why do we need a burden of proof? Why do we need an opportunity to present a defense? We know women don't lie. We know that every accusation made by a woman is true. So we're seeing it in the, con in the area of due process. We're seeing it in the area of free speech. And it's a totalitarian mindset. And you have totalitarians on the left and totalitarians on the right. And what we need is much more of a focus on process much more of a focus on how you get to what you would like to think of as the truth. I'm an agnostic about everything in life. I'm an agnostic about religion, about science, about education. Nothing is ever certain for me. I live in a world of uncertainty, and I think that's where the university should live, in a world of ever-changing uncertainty. And I know for many conservatives that's anathema, because many conservatives, like many hard left progressive, think they have arrived at the truth as well. I think many today are far more tolerant of discourse in the interests of that. Bill Buckley was a close friend of mine, and he was a great person on that. He thought he knew the truth, but he was prepared to have it challenged. So I think we have to rethink the concept of truth, both in the area of due process, in the area of free speech, and focus more, maybe because I'm a lawyer, on the issue of process. And I think that's what's missing on university campuses. Process. Look, we have to eliminate the inequalities. There are still massive inequalities. There are glass ceilings for women. Nobody should ever deny that. And we have to remove all barriers to inequality. That doesn't require diversity in outcome. Today, if you're an African-American man and you're walking down the street or in an elevator or driving a car, you're going to be selectively treated by law enforcement. These are terrible inequalities. We have to fight them, but the answer to inequality is not necessarily the kind of rigid diversity that we see as the counteraction to the inequalities. Eliminating barriers to equality does not require equality of outcome. Well, that's precisely what the hard left disagrees with. I mean, I agree with you that um, there's insufficient respect for the concept of truth and the arduousness of, of the search for truth, the hard work that is required to find the truth. Uh, you know, if you know the truth, you're just relieved of all of that. So it's, it's a very easy out. The second trend that I see is there's a kind of moralization of every political issue. Uh, you're either on the right side or the wrong side, you're either good or evil, and a rejection of, of this understanding of human complexity. As Solzhenitsyn said, the line between good and evil runs through every human heart, which I think it's important to remember, so that's, that's gone. But I am going to be more pessimistic. I am more pessimistic than you are about the elite uh, educational institutions. I think there are a handful of people, there are very few, who are tolerated, who don't toe the line. Um, the progressive catechism, they are tolerated mainly because they tend to stay away from the really hot button issues in a very clever and cagey way. And, and so they're, they're selectively diplomatic, and I admire them for that. But there's also a generational issue uh, that I think you're, you're neglecting, which is that many of the people that you've mentioned are older. They're part of the older generation of academics who still believe in you know, the, the old liberal values, um, the understandings that prevailed for a very long time and seem to have fallen on, on hard times, but the new generation that's coming through, uh, it, all of the conservatives are effectively being screened out. It is almost impossible to be hired uh, at one of these elite universities if you are an open, uh, overt, professed conservative. And the young PhD students, the students who I know, 
they are very aware, aware of that. Uh, many of them are just taking themselves out of the running. The ones who would like an academic career are very, very concerned. Uh, people, young people are, are always coming to me and talking about these issues. Uh, they come into my office, they close the door, uh, and they confess that they're, they're scared. Mm -hmm. uh, they feel like one false move and their whole career is gone. So that's, that is not a good situation. I agree, I agree. I'll tell you an anecdote about that in, in my own life. So I go to college campuses all over the country making what I call the center's case for Israel. Two-state solution and the occupation. I'm a moderate on Israel, but I believe in Israel's right to exist and to defend itself. So I go all over the country and make my speeches. The next day, I get the following call, almost invariably, and it's usually in a whisper. Alan, thank you so much for speaking up on Israel. There's no one on campus who's willing to speak up. I say, Professor, why not you? Oh, no, 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 I can't, I, I can't do that. It would endanger my, my student evaluations, my admission to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, my possibility of transferring elsewhere. I have to tell you, in 50 years of teaching at major elite universities around the world, I have never met a less courageous group of people than tenured professors at major universities. And the full prize, I always say the fault on the Israel issue, which is a cutting edge issue, the fault lies not with the anti-Israel professors, they're expressing their points of view, they're wrong, but they're expressing their points of view. It's the pro-Israel professors who express points of view to friends in synagogues, but don't have the courage to express it on college campuses. I mean, you might not believe me because you hear three professors here who certainly don't like courage to speak up on every issue, but you wouldn't believe how uncourageous tenured professors are. Tenure doesn't work. Tenure is supposed to give you the obligation to speak your mind outside the classroom, not inside the classroom, outside the classroom if you have strong points of view. But professors just lack the courage to do it, and that's a real scandal. The students are the brave ones. You know, the recent student at the University of Michigan who applied for a year of study abroad, her professor said, great, you're a terrific student, I'll write you a recommendation. Where are you going to be studying abroad? Israel, oh, I can't write you that recommendation. Well, she fought back and got the professor suspended and disciplined, and you have to continue to hear. We've had a great first half. Uh, this is part two of the process. I'm going to take questions. Remember, questions, not statements, disguised as questions. Remember, get to the point. 30 seconds, I want a coherent question. Or again, I'll relish cutting you off at the knees. Boy, you're tough. I am. Now well, that's diversity. Okay, first question. Yes, sir. Do we have a microphone for this uh, intrepid gentleman? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, this, this question is for Alan Dershowitz. Uh, there was a book that came out last year um, by a, a geneticist at the Harvard Medical School, David Reich, called uh, Who We Are and How We Got Here, basically describing the rapid advances in genetics. And so in that, in one of the chapters, it says, sooner or later, somebody's going to start to uh, identify the genes that show differences in certain attributes between different populations. We have to be prepared to manage this when it's come out. We might all start now. Because you know that while there's vast differences within a uh, different population, there's good chance or average differences between different populations. So I want to direct that question to you, Alan Dershowitz. That yeah. when these uh, advances keep coming and there are you know discoveries of differences between populations, how how do does college camp how will college campuses manage that? Or how should they manage that? Well, it's a question that for many, many years has uh, plagued universities. I defended Professor Shockley, who won the Nobel Prize for inventing the transistor, when he tried to teach a class at Stanford on what he called dysgenics, making that point you, meant, you mentioned, of course, uh, Professor 
um, the professor who wrote the book on different intelligences, Hernstein and Murray, uh, and they have been ostracized at university campuses. Look, universities have to be open to all scientific truth and research. Many years ago, I represented a professor at the Harvard Medical School who was a psychiatrist, and he had 100 patients over 10 years who had believed that they had been abducted by space aliens. And he examined each of those patients and came to the conclusion that for the vast majority of them, they were not psychotic, they were not schizophrenic, they had no other evidence to suggest hallucinations, that um, there were four or five possible explanations for this. Many of them were working, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day without interruption. And uh, he said among the five explanations, one possible one is that it's true. And uh, Harvard set up a committee to fire him. And I defended him, saying universities have no business inquiring. I mean, if his methodology was false, fine. If he was scientifically, but just because they didn't like his conclusions and it made Harvard look silly, which is what really, really affected the school, you couldn't fire him. We won the case, but he had to spend a lot, I was pro bono, but he had to hire lawyers from outside, law firms, eventually he won the case. There should be no barriers to scientific research uh, at any university, and the, 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 the chips have to fall where they may. Do I think it will show differences? No, I don't. I think that there are too many other factors that are involved that will make it almost impossible to identify and isolate the genetic factors in isolation. But if they did, then we'd have to, we'd have to deal with that. And it will be painful. It will be painful. I, I just want to comment on this, because um, it's something I, I know something about. Uh, I think that behavioral geneticists and the people who do, do population genomics, uh, which is getting much more sophisticated uh, by the minute, are in a pickle. Uh, and they know they are. So people like David Reich, who's nobody's fool, or Paige Harden at the University of Texas, or Steven Pinker for that matter, uh, they know perfectly well that uh, when we start looking at the genetic profiles of different groups, uh, there could well emerge differences that have behavioral implications. Indeed, that's already happened. There are papers in the literature uh, that show that it is possible to identify genetic clusters that predict educational outcomes, years of education. Uh, it's possible to, to create a profile uh, to show that these kinds of behaviors do have a partial genetic basis, and that shouldn't be surprising. Uh, now the question is, what's going to happen as this data emerges? Uh, I think there's going to be a major tussle because efforts will be made to suppress it. Um, the recent scandal involving James Watson is emblematic. Uh, what, what's been done to him and what's been said about him is, you know, ferocious, and I think ferociously unfair. Uh, because much of what he said, not all of it, uh, is just reporting on stable results that have been in the literature forever. But the response is a warning, right? Regardless of what the data shows, don't you dare talk about it. Yeah. And that's going to be a crisis for this field of study. I agree. Question? Ma'am? Right there? Yeah. Yes. Um, that your newspaper, local Can we get a microphone up here? Hey, there's a microphone to the gentleman in the back. Hi. Mr. Rogers, hurry up. <laughs> He's always wonderful. Malibu Surfside newspaper, a local newspaper, asking professors Dershowitz and Wax, relative to the uncertainty state that you referenced, Professor Dershowitz, do you have concerns, professors, concerning journalists failing to live in a state of uncertainty and not being as objective as the First Amendment contemplates? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Look, Walter Cronkite couldn't get a job today. 
Well, what, in my household, we call the New York Times Pravda. Which means true. And, and what's even worse is that many of my students have no idea what that's referring to. Well, people forget, too, that the word political correctness is a Stalinist term. It came from the Stalinist purges, that if you were saying things that were politically incorrect, you could be shot. And how progressives use that term in a positive way, I'll never, ever understand if you know anything about the history of communism and totalitarianism, the idea that you would be proud of uh, adhering to political correctness is is just so absurd. Journalism is in a terrible, terrible way. Uh, uh, I have been trying to be fair and objective in my assessment of what's going on with President Trump and the uh, Mueller investigation. I would have been saying the same things exactly, by the way, if Hillary Clinton had been elected president and the Republicans who were yelling lock her up or impeach her were trying to impeach her. In fact, I originally was gonna write my book, which is now called The Case Against impeaching Trump, the original title of the book was The Case Against Impeaching Hillary Clinton. And in fact, it was a cover. And had I done that, I would have had a statue built to me on Martha's Vineyard. But instead, we've had to come up with a third cover for the book. It's a brown paper envelope. So people can feel free to read the book without anybody knowing they're reading it. And even in places like Martha's Vineyard, but to turn this seriously, you know, many of you know I used to be on CNN all the time. I was a frequent guest on Anderson Cooper. I was a frequent guest on Cuomo. I was a frequent guest on Lemon. Uh, I have not been asked for the last eight months to be on CNN because they don't like my nuanced point of view on what's going on in Washington. They want to be what Fox was purported to be. They want to be able to say, we are the anti-Fox. And they have made actually more money doing that, just like the ACLU. The ACLU, has, its budget has gone from 30 million to 130 million as soon as Trump was elected, as soon as they decided to abandon civil liberties and devote all of their time to getting Trump, no matter what the cost in civil liberties, they have made a fortune. So being one-sided is profitable today. Being nuanced, being an attempt to try to be Walter Cronkite is a guarantee of unemployment. That's what's happening to journalism today, and it's a very, very sad state. Sir? Uh, yes? What can be done in the working world to return to a neutral environment focused on work and service, not on politics, issues, or social agendas. Wow. Uh, you, you really tapped into uh, an interesting issue. And once again, there's a broader point to be made here. The takeover by this progressive ideology, the grievance politics, the victimology, the division of the world into good and evil, oppressor and oppressed, and that whole uh, sort of agenda is not just confined to the universities, it's been ceded to K through 12 education and the workplace and businesses, uh, which used to be about doing their business, right, no longer are. They have become the quintessential social justice warriors who are pushing this agenda and imposing it on the people who work there and are trying to make a living. And there's a reason for that, which is that these uh, selective universities, these elite universities, are sending their graduates out into the world to do good, and they are running these companies and deciding that you know they know how to do good. The watchwords are the usual, the buzzwords, diversity, inclusion, uh, recognizing and admitting that we're all racist, we're all biased, we're all bigoted, we're all xenophobic. <coughs> Uh, we all have to confess to these sins, and of course these sins become the all-purpose explanations for why success is not evenly distributed between all groups, all genders, 
When you run a meritocracy, uh, you don't necessarily get the results that you want. So uh, it's all kind of a cover for, uh, for results that are considered undesirable. Well, let me challenge you on that. I don't think we know whether if you run a real meritocracy, you don't get those kinds of outcomes. Because we've never tried a real meritocracy. I go back to my own life, I have to brag a little. I'll start by telling you what a terrible student I was in high school, okay. But when I got to Brooklyn College, first in my family, I was first in my class at Brooklyn College, first in my class at Yale Law School, editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Journal, and a Supreme Court law clerk, and I got turned down by 32 out of 32 Wall Street firms. Only one gave me an interview. Because in those days, there was no meritocracy. If you were a Jew from an Eastern European country, you couldn't work at Cravath or Sullivan and Cromwell, any of the fancy big firms. Um, okay, that was my experience. We still have some of those experiences today. We have not yet eliminated enough barriers to inequality to be able to test the hypothesis that meritocracies won't ultimately, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next week, but that meritocracies won't ultimately produce a better kind of diversity of every kind, racial, ethnic, gender, sexual orientation, um, religious, than any kind of artificial attempt to do it. So let's first eliminate all the barriers to inequality, let's create a true meritocracy, and then we'll come back and discuss whether we have to tinker with that to get to the kinds of results that keep us apart today. But if we can get to those results, Without the tinkering, it's a win-win for everybody. Mr. Rogers, what are your thoughts on California State Bill uh, 820, I believe, that bans private settlements? And what are some of the negative outcomes of a law like that? I, I don't understand the law. It bans private settlements? Correct. You can't have a private settlement uh, in California. Are you talking about confidentiality? Yes. Well, that's different. You could certainly, I mean, you, the legal system would break down tomorrow if you couldn't have settlements. First of all, 92% of criminal cases are settled. They're called guilty pleas, so obviously they're settled. Uh, they don't go to trial. I would say probably 98% of civil cases are settled. What you're talking about is if a woman or somebody charges somebody with sexual misconduct and hush money is paid as part of a settlement, that you can't have that settlement be confidential. Look, I think the public has general, in general, I would always want to err on the side of, of publicity rather than, rather than privacy, public knowledge, rather than privacy, but I have, I have to admit, I haven't thought through all the implications of a statute like that, or whether it should be done by statute or in any other way, so it's, it's a hard question. Yeah, I think there are costs and benefits to a law like that. I mean, the, the private, the confidentiality clauses that I'm aware of, for example, in cases coming out of universities that are settled with their accusations under Title IX and the like, I think their effects are very mischievous if the terms are kept private because a lot of people's misfeasance and misconduct, including the accusers, as well as the accused, uh, are kept out of the public eye, so you know people don't know what's going on. That's bad. On the other hand, if you use the heavy hand of the law to ban these, then you're going to get fewer settlements. So yeah. that could be a cost. You really have to see how it plays out in practice. Sure. Uh, so, Henry Louis Gates Jr. is another Harvard professor. I don't think it's Harvard Law, but I'm pretty sure it's a Harvard undergrad. A few years ago, he wrote a pretty influential piece regarding the use of speech codes on college campuses. And in his piece, he argued that speech codes on college campuses were disproportionately used to prosecute the speech of minorities on college campuses. Of oh, what? Uh, the speech of minorities on college campuses, minority groups, or minority individuals. Uh, do you believe that things like speech codes... I'm not, I'm not understanding your question. You're saying that speech codes are used against what, racial minorities more? Yeah, that's essentially what that's Chase Jr. argues that's in just his article. That's empirically bogus. That's, that's, that's what I wanted to ask. Totally yeah. bogus, it's just not true. Um, if anything, I would suggest it would certainly be the opposite. Um, I think that the minorities on campus are far more protected by virtually every rule that the university has. They're not more protected in real society 
they're far less protected. And but within the university context, I find it hard to believe that racial minorities or sexual orientation minorities are the victims of speech code disproportionately. I just don't believe that. Mr. Rogers, yeah. Uh, to either one of you, uh, do you ever hear, particularly from conservatives, that maybe the time is coming to look at the funding of public universities, and since which are partly funded by conservatives, and is that a discussion that you ever hear of or would, would, would promote? Well, yeah, that topic does come up. Um, public universities are a, a big part of you know our university system, and they get a lot of generous funding from state legislatures. Uh, I think, you know, once again, the obstacles to using that as an instrument to influence uh, how universities conduct their business are enormous. Um, these academic institutions do have, they're self-governing, they do have autonomy, the faculties are the ultimate arbiters of academic quality, who gets fired, who gets hired, who gets promoted. Uh, and it, it's very hard to meddle with that system by, by uh, intervening uh, on a micro level, on a retail level, with how the universities actually are run. Uh, so it's not a terribly fruitful avenue, uh, and it has all sorts of dangers. Mm -hmm. I think one way in which uh, public universities can mitigate the problem of the one-sidedness of opinion on campus is by funding uh, centers where uh, conservatives are welcome or conservative ideas are aired and actually that's happening both in public and private universities. So Yale has the Buckley Center which is an oasis I think of of uh, free thought and uh, a place where conservative ideas do get some uh, airing. Um, the Madison Center at Princeton, um, our University of Arizona and University of Colorado have similar programs. So the important thing is to create those parallel programs and institutions that balance uh, the opinions that you know, there there is an imbalance and a one-sidedness. I think Alan did refer to this. We don't want to really suppress the other side's views. It's to get the full range of views and expose students to the full range of views, and that's what's not happening. I agree. I agree with that. Except that most of these think tanks, the uh, the, the, the Hoover Institution, etc., they tend to be conservative think tanks funded by wealthy conservatives, and they do strike an appropriate check and balance on the uh, other universities. I think an important point to make, though, is the distinction between private and public universities are quickly disappearing as the result of the federal government imposing requirements on private universities as a condition of getting funding. Let me give you an example. When the um, Obama administration created this absurdly unconstitutional requirement that all universities that receive any federal funding have to permit the preponderance of the evidence standard to govern any accusations of sexual assault. About 50 Harvard Law professors, including virtually all the women on the Harvard Law School faculty, wrote objecting, saying, no, Harvard Law School, we teach our students about due process. We're not gonna discipline students based on a preponderance of the evidence, which is 51%, which means for every 100 people convicted, 49 of them are innocent and we're gonna expel them. That's absurd. We wanna have clear and convincing evidence or proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And the faculty voted overwhelmingly for that. Then we get a call, of course, from the university council saying, if you insist on having due process for your students, the medical school will lose all of its cancer funding. That's extortion. The law school can do without federal funding, but the medical school can't do without federal funding. And the federal government treats universities as a unit. Or for example, when the Buckley Amendment was passed, which prohibited university, not the Buckley Amendment, I'm sorry, uh, the, the amendment that was passed, you'll, some of you will remember the name, but I don't, that said, if you don't permit recruitment uh, on college campuses, 
By the military, you lose your federal funding. Uh, again, some of the departments wanted to fight that because it violates their policies against discrimination, gender discrimination, sexual orientation discrimination. They couldn't do it because it would mean cutting off all the funding from the medical school and other departments. So the federal government has turned private universities into universities governed by executive order of the president which puts private universities in many respects into centers of private universities in the worst of all situations. You don't have First Amendment rights because it's a private university, and you don't have the right to even get the majority of the faculty to do the right thing because of the federal funding. It's, it's a bizarre situation, and even though, again, I'm not a supporter of this president of this administration, I am a supporter of the Education Department's decision to rescind the Obama administration's uh, rulings about denial of due process on campus. We're at the end of our time. We have one more question. One more question. And then each of the panelists will have two minutes to wrap it up. This has been a wonderful and stimulating discussion. Thank you, Amy Wax and Alan Dershowitz. This is the final question. Yes, ma'am. Harvard University, in order to discourage students from joining single-sex social organizations such as fraternities and sororities, have said that those students that do so are prohibited from being the captain of their sports team, that they cannot have leadership positions in student government, and that they will not support their application for Rose Scholarship. Mm -hmm. My sorority, Delta Gamma, is uh, has a lawsuit against Harvard Good. saying that this is discriminatory. I was going to ask you what you thought and who you thought would prevail. Well, I have a very complicated view on this. I was the leader of the campaign to try to get rid of seat, uh, finals clubs at Harvard. I thought that the Fly Club, for example, was a terrible place where uh, men, uh, many times, I don't want to overgeneralize, but drunk men uh, did some awful things to vulnerable uh, women. I don't like the Fly Club. I, I led a campaign, zip up the fly. Uh, um, um, I thought it was sexist, and I certainly uh, wouldn't want anybody I know. Of course, my grandson was furious at me when I did that, because he was a Harvard student, and he got passed over by all the finals clubs, presumably because of my strong opposition to it. So I hate finals clubs. I hate clubs generally that exclude and discriminate. And, you know, have, I, I, I'm not a big fan of fraternities. I don't like rushing. I don't like any of that stuff. So you got the wrong guy if you want me to support fraternities, sororities, finals clubs. But I am appalled at the Harvard rule. You do not deny students who have had enormous academic achievement the right to be a Rhodes Scholar or the right to be a captain of their football team or the right to be the head of this or that because you disagree with their politics. I disagree with people who join finals clubs, but I would never under any circumstances deny them these privileges. And I hope the lawsuit prevails. I hope Harvard University has to stop discriminating against students based on the content of their ideological and political views. And here's another example of me defending students with whom I fundamentally disagree. But I think the process issue is of overwhelming importance, and no university should be using high-handed methods like that. The best they can do is disassociate themselves from the clubs, which they've already done. Maybe even advise, this. even this goes a little too far, when the university advises people, individuals like I can advise people not to join these clubs, but I don't want to see the university in the business of telling people what kind of Halloween costumes they can wear, what kind of clubs they can join, and what kind of people they can associate with. That's just tyranny. Well, I think this is in the ilk of the very kind of extortionate behavior that the Obama administration was using against universities on the basis of their uh, financial leverage, and Harvard is doing the same thing. I actually disagree with Alan. I, I am not opposed to finals clubs or to private clubs or to fraternities or sororities. I think that they are useful institutions, that people join them for a reason because they need groups and friends and places where they can socialize and, and feel comfortable. And My grandson agrees with you. Uh, and, and, 
you know, no one forces any woman to go to a party at any fraternity or sorority. I think we really infantilize women. The, when you said the word vulnerable, I, uh, I, I sort of shivered a little bit. I, I agree that uh, adolescent women do need sometimes protection from their own judgment, but when you get to college, hopefully you are mature enough to make those decisions, especially if you are guided by people in authority towards uh, prudence and self-care, which doesn't seem I, to I happen disagree. anymore. I don't disagree with that. Um, but, you know, we, we tend to neglect the upsides of these institutions and focus on the downsides. Um, there's a certain kind of thread in progressive thought that I think is all or none, and I see it everywhere. I see it in the rejection of nationalism. I see it in uh, attitudes towards diversity and inclusion. I see it in, in you know, rejecting bourgeois values because they were associated with the 50s, and the 50s was an irredeemably evil time. Uh, these institutions are not all or none. Uh, as a friend of mine said, you know, love leads to homicide, it leads to suicide, it leads to misery. Should we abolish love? <laughs> so there's lots of potential for abuse of these institutions, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a use. And, you know, Harvard University is a private institution, they're entitled to make judgments, they're entitled to decide, you know, what their students can or can't do. It's not a matter of entitlement, it's a matter of wisdom. And I think it shows a lack of wisdom to interfere with students' social decisions uh, to this extent. So, I, I don't, wish I don't, you luck. I don't disagree with that. I think you, I, I, I agree. Students should have a choice. I would just like them to choose, to choose not to join finals clubs. Thank you very much. Now, this is the final segment. We are, um, let's start this time with Alan Dershowitz. Two minutes to wrap up, then to Amy Wax, and then I'm going to introduce and reintroduce Jennifer uh, of the Steamboat Institute. We'll have some final words to say and also direct you to the reception that follows this wonderful event. Alan? I'm worried about freedom of speech. I'm worried about due process. I'm worried about all the civil liberties values that I spent my life uh, defending. Um, I'm worried that the people who now defend free speech and due process, some of them do so because they've been victimized by it. I very much worry about the, for me but not for thee. And I would just hope that the one good thing about what's going on now with President Trump is that it's finally turned many conservatives into civil libertarians at just the time it's needed because the old civil libertarians have become strong supporters of the police state and find no criticism of the FBI. You know, we live in such a topsy-turvy world. When I was growing up in the dreaded 50s, and some good things happened. The Brooklyn Dodgers won the World Series in 1955. Um, when I was growing up in the dreaded 1950s, we liberals didn't trust the FBI. We didn't trust prosecutors. We didn't trust law enforcement. We challenged all of that. It's the conservatives who said, don't worry about J. Edgar Hoover. He's a good man. He's the head of the FBI. Everything's turned on its head now. Today, it's the liberals that say, of course you have to trust Mueller. How dare you raise any questions about his integrity? How dare you raise questions about the FBI, about prosecutors, about the police? You know, the raid on Cohen's office, that was a good thing. Locking Stone up in handcuffs and, and shackles, that was a, that's coming from the old liberals and the old civil libertarians. And now the conservatives are saying, no, due process. We need to have protection. We need to make sure we're skeptical of government. That's kind of healthy, but I hope it's not temporary. And so people ask me all the time, are you a pessimist or an optimist? In Israel, they say a pessimist is somebody who thinks things are so bad, oy, they can't possibly get any worse. An optimist says, yes, they can. <laughs> I am not that kind of an optimist. When I see people like you folks out here in this great university, I have become much more of a real optimist. So thank you very much. Yeah, I'm 
going to channel Alan by making this about the audience, so I guess I would have three pieces of advice. First, this used to be the watchword for you know the lefty hippies, question authority, but I guess I would say, please, question the authority that's in power today, question the powers that be, because uh, they, are, they are messing with your brain. Uh, the second is, show some courage in your endeavors, dare to stand up for what you believe, uh, dare to politely and persistently argue with the people who would seek to intimidate you and to tell you that there is only one set of acceptable opinions, and I know that here in California you're surrounded by such people. <laughs> they are your supposed friends, but of course their friendship these days is provisional on your holding the right attitudes. And that is a sad, sad thing. I know because I have lost uh, supposed friends. Uh, over uh, some of my beliefs, although uh, I've also seen people who have, against the tide, uh, stuck with me. So I've, I've seen uh, both sides of that. And finally, um, defund the Ivies. Take your money, and I know that you have some money out there, and rethink what you do with it. Uh, Alan talked about how, well, the Ivies you know, teach people to be concerned about the truly disadvantaged, those at the bottom of our society, and I will concede that. But there is a vast middle out there of ordinary people struggling to make their life work, and it is becoming harder and harder for all sorts of reasons for the average person to construct a decent life. Think about what privileged people can do for the average person to make their life better. Uh, I think if we want to understand the current political moment, the election of Trump, what's behind that and what's going on, we need to focus on that neglected middle because it really is sorely, sorely neglected in so many ways. Thank you, Jim McCook, for coming. Thank you, Amy Wilde. Thank you, Alan Dershowitz, for a wonderful event. Thank you to the Steve Bowen Institute for sponsoring it. And, and thank you to the Pepperdine School of Public Policy, committed from the beginning to telling people what they need to know, but may not want to hear. Thanks for a great night, and thank you all. enjoy this beautiful dessert reception. But once again, didn't Bob Kaufman do a great job? <laughs> School of Public Policy, and Melissa Espinoza, you all have just been tremendous to work with. Um, if you would like to know more about the Steamboat Institute, I encourage you to go to our website, steamboatinstitute.org, sign up for our email list, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're putting out lots of good information throughout the day, every day. I think you would be amazed at, at some of the discussions we get going and the information you can get. Coming up later in April, another uh, later in the spring and late April, uh, one, another reason you want to be on our email list, we're planning a socialism versus capitalism debate tour. If we can find someone to debate, you're Ron Brooke. So far, we've been turned down by Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Beto O'Rourke, and we're in discussions with Senator Elizabeth Warren, so stay tuned. <laughs> Festival in Steamboat Springs, Colorado every year in August. We have scholarships that you can apply for. Starting March 1st, go to steamboatinstitute.org. There will be a scholarship application. We cover your air, lodging, registration, and we make sure that these young leaders who attend on scholarship get to meet these national and global leaders 
that come to our conference. It is a tremendous opportunity. So steamboatinstitute.org, scholarship applications, March 1st, with flyers out in the foyer. Last thing I would like to say is that the Steamboat Institute is a, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that depends solely on the support of the public, people like you, and foundations who support our work. So if you are so inclined and, and want to see us do more Campus Liberty Tour work, we would love to have your support. We would love to earn your support. And now, once again, at the, uh, at the, due to the generosity of the Pepperdine School of Public Policy, we're going to have this beautiful dessert reception just outside. We have patio eaters. We're going to do book signings. All three of our professors are signing books. So thank you again for coming, and uh, thank you, thanks again to our speakers. Nathan.